Today's episode is all about the... Greetings. Future Ollie? I haven't seen you since we did that episode on the philosophy of Doctor Who. What are you doing here? I mean, what, what are we doing here? <laughs> I've come from the future to help you discuss the metaphysics of time. Are we going to have a cool intro title sequence like last time? We've done two videos on the metaphysics of time before, and it's time now to revisit it and talk about a view called presentism. It's pretty easy to explain presentism. Only the present exists. If we were to make a list of everything that exists, only present things would be on it. The nature of the present is always changing, but there are no things that are not temporally present. Which I suppose raises a few questions as to how you're here. Why would anyone believe presentism? Well, say you're not a presentist. Say you're the opposite, an eternalist. Somebody who believes that objects in the past and the future exist just as much as present objects. Well, where are they then? Where are the dinosaurs? Where is Napoleon? Not just the present evidence that they existed, mind. Where are the objects themselves? And if they're completely undetectable, even in principle, then what's the difference between saying that and just admitting that they don't exist? Hmm, okay, it's an interesting idea. So the past and the future don't exist, just this one moment, the present. Well, aside from your being here, there are two major problems with this. In order to make the grounding objection, we first have to assume two things, both of which are pretty intuitive. Firstly, we need to assume that we can make true statements about the past and the future. For instance, it will rain on Tuesday, or Napoleon fought at Waterloo. These sorts of things can be true. Secondly, we have to assume that truth depends on what exists. For instance, grass is green is true because there exists something called grass, which has the property of greenness. And there are no unicorns is true because zero unicorns exist. The fancy way of saying this is that truth supervenes on existence. Presentism seems to be incompatible with these two assumptions, because if the past and the future don't exist, then we can't make true statements about them. T-Rex was 40 feet long is as true as Abraham Lincoln is King of Mars. There exists no thing to make this statement true. No truth maker. Statements about the past and the future are literally false which is irritating because we use them rather a lot, and we count on them being true. If it is literally false that it will rain tomorrow, then you have no reason to carry an umbrella. And if it is literally false that a criminal committed a crime, then we have no reason to punish them. Now the obvious reply here is to say, well, dinosaurs don't exist in the present, but they used to exist. They existed in the pa- Oh dear. According to the presentist, that's the same as saying that they don't exist. We can't make sense of the idea of something formally existing, because there are no former times in which anything could exist. Remember that the presentist says that only the present exists. Well, the present must be a moment in time so small that it is instantaneous. The present cannot be temporally extended. Why is that? Well, say the present was one second long, then you could divide it into earlier and later. You'd have past and future, which the presentist denies exists. So if you're a presentist, everything must exist at the same time, simultaneously, because there are no other times at which anything could exist. The problem is, special relativity tells us that there is no such thing as absolute simultaneity. Whether two events appear to be simultaneous will depend on your frame of reference. You can think that two things look simultaneous to you, but somebody in a different frame of reference might see them as not simultaneous. 
Now, unfortunately, I don't have time to do a whole video on special relativity, so if that sounds absolutely bonkers to you, as it did the first time I heard it, then you're just going to have to take my word for it or do your own research. In other words, presentism seems incompatible with special relativity. Presentism requires everything to exist simultaneously, but we know that that can't happen. Footnote. If you're a physicist, you might be thinking that the present could be a Planck time long. That's 10 to the minus 43 seconds, the smallest interval of time that physics can make sense of. That's a very small window of time, but it's not instantaneous. So could the presentist get around this problem by saying the present isn't an instant, it's just very, very small? I don't think they can. Say that the present is a Planck time long. If that's the smallest possible unit of time, then it doesn't make sense to talk of earlier and later, because to talk of earlier and later within a Planck time would be to split it up into two smaller sections, which you can't do. So functionally, it does the same job. There are still no other times at which anything could exist. The trouble is, there's still no wiggle room for special relativity to work there. There are no different times at which different observers could see the same events. So I don't think that presentism can get around this objection whether the present is instantaneous or whether it is as long as some smallest possible unit of time. Which, I think, leaves presentism up a creek. I think this is one of those rare and happy cases where science comes in and actually partially settles a philosophical question, a little bit like Darwin did with Paley's argument from design for biological organisms. And if you want, there's a free link in the description to an article going into the clash between special relativity and presentism in a little bit more detail. But what do you think? Does presentism appeal to you? Can you think of a reply to the grounding objection or the objection from special relativity? Next time, we could either do Is the Law Like a Comic Book? or we could do Should You Save the Greatest Number? And next week, there's going to be a special episode on nuclear weapons, so don't miss it. If you're from the future, you, you must already know which way the vote is going to go, don't you? I do, but I can't stick around to tell you. I have to be getting back. Back, A. Eh? Where, where are you going back to, exactly? Back to my house. Oh, I, t <laughs> I thought you were going to say Back to the Future. And, and then I could, I could play a clip from Back to the Future or play some of the music or something. No, that's copyrighted material. You can't put that on YouTube. Oh. Oh. Uh, I, I guess I'll just do the, I'll do the comments from last time then. Okay. Bye. Anyway, last time we asked, is Cinema Sins the future of criticism? So let's see what you guys have to say. Austin Labonte made a very interesting point. They said that when they read an article from Film Crit Hulk, or one of the more traditional style of critics, they get more out of it than they get from watching a Cinema Sins video. Which is quite cool because maybe it suggests that there's more to criticism than just reviewing the thing that you're critiquing. Like, I know that when I watch uh, Movie Bob or when I read one of Film Crit Hulk's lengthy essays, I do get more out of the movie than I do from just watching cinema scenes. So that's quite cool. Maybe that means that part of criticism is enhancing your intellectual dispositions as an audience member and your ability to interpret a work of art. So maybe there's more to criticism than just criticism. Bud Parker suggested that one of those extra features to criticism might be helping you decide how best to spend your money. And maybe CinemaSins wouldn't be so good at helping you do that. Well, I know that when I watch a CinemaSins video, I do get a feel for whether or not I like the film or whether or not I would like the series. So if that is one of the extra features, then CinemaSins could be quite helpful for that, I think. Queer Mint Critic said that CinemaSins often focus on narrative and how the sins they highlight impact the narrative of the film. So they're not so much a new style of critic that doesn't appeal to justifying norms. They do have this one norm at their heart, which is if something negatively impacts the narrative, then it counts as bad. That's quite interesting. I'm going to have to have a look out for that next time I watch Cinema Sins. Thank you. If you remember, one of the problems with traditional styles of criticism we were talking about was that when critics appeal to justifying norms, they often have counterexamples. And Monroe Beardsley, one of the philosophers we were discussing, said that if we can make these norms specific enough, then we might be able to get around that. But Constantine K said that if we did that, then they're probably going to have to be so specific that they'd only apply to one particular work, which would defeat the purpose of having them. 
I don't know, that, that is a worry that some people have had. I guess the only way to find out would be to actually try it. I Maytag said that if Beardsley can come up with rules for determining what makes a work of art good, then does that mean that in the future we'll just kind of replace critics with a, a computer or a formula that determines exactly how good a work of art is? Well, I'm not sure Beardsley said that you can figure out exact rules for determining how good a work of art is. I think what he was going at was more that you can come up with general standards. You can say that these features generally make a work better or worse without, you know, interfering reasons, rather than this feature automatically means plus 10 points of artistic goodness. So I think you could probably get around that. Louis Parry Mills said that the intentions of a work of art's creator should be borne in mind when we're assessing its quality. So if the creator intended it to have some feature or have some effect and it fails to do that or isn't as good as it needs to be in order to get that effect, then that means that the work of art is bad. And if it succeeds, then that's good. Well, a few people have suggested that, but one of the worries with that is that surely a work of art could be good insofar as it departs from the creator's intentions. For instance, a while ago I saw a production of Hamlet, which was a new interpretation according to which Hamlet was actually the villain and Claudius, his uncle, was innocent and never actually murdered Hamlet's father. And if the production was good, and if it carried that interpretation off well, then it would be good insofar as it departed from Shakespeare's original intention, because it's obvious reading the text that that's not the exact way he meant it, though you can do it that way if you make certain cuts. So that means that it would be good insofar as it actually goes against his wishes, which we couldn't do if creator intention determined quality. Aquavilo said that they're actually an art student, and when they do art, they're encouraged to separate the justifying norms, like what makes a work of art better or worse, from the value judgement, whether or not audiences like it or dislike it. And I can definitely see why that would be useful, especially when you're in art school. You want people to be able to say, oh, if you'd done this, it might have been slightly better, if you'd done this, it would have been slightly worse, without them hurting your feelings by saying, it's rubbish, I hate it, it's dreadful, it makes me feel sick inside just looking at it. So I can see why that would be useful, but... At the same time, how are we going to explain why the norms are important, why making a work of art better or worse is actually an important thing to do, without referencing whether or not people are going to like it? So, do you see what I mean? I don't think that would work across the board, because I think without the value judgments, the norms would be kind of empty, there would be no point in having them. That's all the time we've got this week, don't forget next week there's a special episode on nuclear weapons, so tune in for that. Thank you very much for watching, and I will see you then. Bye!